Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for the weekly Greater Manchester COVID briefing. My apologies uh, for a technical issue that uh, slightly delayed us this afternoon, but thanks for bearing with us. And uh, I'm going to start, as usual, by passing over to Sir Richard Lees, uh, our lead on health and care in the Greater Manchester City region, to take you through the, uh, the slides. Richard. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Andy. Um, start off with the, uh, I think, what's been the first slide the last few weeks. This is looking at the number of positive cases per 100,000 uh, population. Just look at the top line uh, for Greater Manchester. Uh, you will see that there has been yet another significant uh, increase, probably about a 75, 80% increase since uh, l last week. This is up to the um, uh, 8th of January. And um, I think the view is that the number is still increasing or increasing, although the rate of increase may have uh, slowed down. Uh, I suppose the only bit of good news within this is the England average is 630. So we're still uh, way behind that. But this is not clearly not good that uh, uh, positive tests are continuing. If we move on. Uh, this shows the age profile of who's testing positive. Um, if, if you re recall last week, it was pretty yellow. It's now getting increasingly into those dark colours. Those dark colours are on, in younger age groups overall. So uh, the uh, the uh, 16 to 44 year olds principally. And I, th I think the risk, of course, is that that goes up through the age groups. It's still the case when we get to hospitalisation, it is still older people very much are being hospitalised. There has been no increase in the portion of younger people being uh, hospitalised. I know that's been talked about, but that's not what's happening. Uh, they probably the, the biggest group in hospitals at the moment are now 50 to 75 year olds. If you want to move on. Uh, positivity rates probably improved a little bit, but that's probably likely to be a blip rather than anything else. It's still a relatively high positivity rate. And again, if we can move on. Uh, care homes still performing well. Uh, I, th I think really pleased that we, we we are managing to control what's happening in care homes. And of course, we are now uh, beginning to make progress with vaccinations for both care home residents and staff as well. And not done them all yet, all yet, but there is the programs are in place, particularly uh, for those care homes that who have a lot of those very much older uh, residents or those with critical care needs. Move on. Uh, this is a slide that shows a uh, number of COVID cases occupying hospital beds in, in, in Greater Manchester. Uh, that what's happening is that numbers are going uh, going up. I talked about the rate going up to 100 a day. It's now up to 120. Uh, it's it, it is the rate of uh, admissions is increasing uh, still quite significantly. If you look at the number of people in critical care beds, uh, this slide shows and this was yesterday's number 138. I can tell you it's now 147 uh, and, and that's uh, that number is continuing to increase again at a rapid rate. Uh, at the moment there are around about. Uh, there, there, there's some kind of uncertainty around the figures, but the hospital goal will tell us that there are now just under 300. ICU beds uh, in, in play. Uh, when, when of those that are occupied, and you can't occupy them all because of the separation between COVID and uh, non-COVID, non and uh, the biggest number of uh, patients in ICU now are COVID, and they're the majority again. And something we've not seen yet in the current round of the crisis is a diminution in people uh, coming into uh, a and E, who should come into A and E? We're now beginning to see that we are beginning to see people effectively beginning to avoid going to hospital if they're non-COVID uh, patients, and that's clearly a concern that people who do need urgent care might not be taking uh, taking that up. So we would continue to urge people who are seriously ill see the GP, go to uh, contact the GP, contact uh, A and E if you need treatment, get get treatment. But I think that's a real concern. The other concern which we have talked about is that uh, uh, we are now beginning to see uh, delays in priority 
uh, operations. It's one of those inevitable consequences uh, of this, which is uh, again the extent to which there are sufficient staff and beds in order to be to be, meet the challenges that our hospitals are facing. I talked a week ago about the risk of our hospitals falling over. They're not falling over at the moment, but clearly the pressure on the hospitals are growing all the time, both in critical care and in uh, general and acute uh, beds. Again, one of the things I talked about last week where we could really do with help from families apart from anything else is discharge of patients. And there are quite a lot of patients waiting discharge that have no medical reason uh, to be in hospital and have no particular care needs uh, uh, either. And it's a real difficulty in being able to, in some cases, persuade those people to be discharged from hospital, even though uh, there's no medical reason and we do need the beds. And I think uh, for a lot of uh, older, more frailer people, uh, families could be enormously helpful in that task of persuading people that uh, they need to go home because we are talking about discharge to home. I think we also need to get over to a lot of people is that uh, we now do have well worked systems of what is called in the jargon discharge to assess, but where people who do have care needs can be discharged from hospital into a care setting. That's not a permanent care setting, but one where they can get the assessment they need for their uh, long term care needs, whether that's care needs at home or in a care, a, a care setting really important that we do get people out of the hospital. Um, this is not going to go away anytime soon in terms of the demand on hospitals. We haven't reached the peak yet. We probably will start to reach a peak in uh, a week or, or two weeks, but then it, it's not going to be a peak where we go over the top and come down. It is more likely to be a, a plateau. We still haven't got the numbers from New Year's Eve and what happened then in uh, what's going on in hospitals that will come in the next uh, next week. But really, we, we cannot say loud enough that, to that message. A big thank you to everybody who is complying, and clearly that's the vast majority of the population. But that message to that small minority who are putting lots of people at risk, we are really now very much in, I think, the worst crisis we've been through the whole of the COVID, COVID situation. Do you want to move on to the next slide? Uh, this is a comparison of what's what's happening. Clearly, it, when we showed this slide a few weeks ago, you will see the uh, change in infections in Greater Manchester and the Northwest was actually below everybody else. Now it's above everybody else, and that's uh, really uh, we might be playing catch up, but we are catching up. And I think we just need to be clear about uh, that. At the moment, the position is continuing to deteriorate. We, we certainly haven't reached. Uh, the end of uh, uh, the, the growth period yet. And move on. Uh, this is where we're up to uh, with vaccines. As of this week, all of our vaccination centres uh, will be up and running, certainly by the uh, uh, by the end of the week. So we are in a position to accelerate the number of vaccinations. Uh, assuming that we do get the uh, supplies of vaccine turning up. And I think there is a concern uh, that there might be su supply problems around that. And I think there's a very strong message about those priority uh, groups. And I think the uh, position of the uh, Joint Committee on Vaccinations and Im Immunisation is for those four top groups, if we want to save the most lives, they are the groups that we vaccinate in order to be able to save the most most lives. That's what the evidence says, and I think we have to uh, take that. So I think we have to be quite strong on making sure we maintain that priority list uh, until we've got through all of those uh, people, bearing in mind that what we don't want to be doing is to be either wasting vaccines or vaccinator time. So uh, if there is a risk of that, then we ought to be able to include on the margins uh, on, the, on the standby basis, not on a standard basis, the people in the other groups uh, uh, within that. I know that there, are, there is some debate about vaccination for uh, key, key workers outside of the health and care sector. Uh, really, if, if the objective is to save lives, they have to come after the people who are in the, that, those current top four priority groups. Next slide. 
So that, uh, it, or is it? Uh, okay, actually, now that is my last slide. I think the next one's uh, uh, yours, Andy. So uh, I say the, the, the big messages are there. Thanks to everybody who is complying. Please, please, to everybody else, uh, follow, follow the rules. Uh, if you can help get people out of hospital, uh, help, us, uh, help us do that. Uh, but we are really in a deteriorating position in our hospital. Haven't fallen over yet, but you uh, cannot believe, I think, the stresses that particularly our clinical staff are uh, under. And the more we can do to try and relieve those pressures, the better. Thanks, Andy. Thanks a lot. Sir. And just to echo what you said, the vast majority of people are observing the rules and um, are helping us manage what is still a, a very critical situation, as Richard uh, described. We're not at the England average, uh, and potentially the national lockdown may have had an effect that might help uh, Greater Manchester not see the same peaks that we've seen in other parts of the country. But it's too early to call that definitively yet. We will have to see how the next couple of weeks um, unfold. So uh, a very uh, a very challenging uh, situation, particularly for our uh, colleagues in the NHS, but also for colleagues in Greater Manchester Police. We'll actually give a separate briefing tomorrow on uh, next steps uh, with regard to the HMIC report uh, and addressing the concerns uh, that that uh, raised uh, more generally about how we um, embrace a new era in Greater Manchester Police and improve accountability to the public. But we will say more about that uh, tomorrow. Just to focus today on the issues with regard to enforcement, because while the vast majority of people are doing the right thing and we're grateful to them, there is a, um, a significant minority uh, who, who are not. To give you the figures, over the last seven days, uh, there were 1,131 reports of COVID uh, related breaches across uh, Greater Manchester, 623 related to um, uh, house parties or, or gatherings, 53 to other uh, forms of gathering in, in the home, uh, 89 um, uh, gatherings outside or in, or in other locations. So a high number for uh, the weekend just gone, 120 fixed penalty notices were issued, 140 uh, overall over the last seven days. Um, which takes the total of fixed penalty notices so far to 2,550. So th there is still a significant amount of um, uh, of um, disregard of of the rules, um, and obviously that is um, uh, very difficult to, to see when we when we also then see the picture in the NHS. Some of the breaches relate to repeat offenders. So Greater Manchester Police are reporting being called out. Uh, to the same address on a number of occasions uh, and working with them we will support them taking uh, uh, tougher action working with our councils as well against those who are repeatedly breaking the Covid uh, legislation. If I could just turn on to workplaces um, because we also received 175 um, or Grace Manager Police did 175 uh, complaints over the last week about businesses remaining open. Some of those calls um, related to businesses legitimately open and it was just a misunderstanding about whether uh, the person complaining understood whether or not they were allowed to open, but others were trading um, illegally uh, and uh, fines uh, were, were issued, some hairdressers, some hand car washes uh, in, that, in that category. Other complaints led to um, a visit by Greater Manchester Police together with trading standards uh, colleagues at a district uh, level. And we just wanted to share a slide with you today, which is uh, new data, which has come through uh, a regular uh, Greater Manchester survey, which we're now doing monthly uh, to try and give a, a clearer picture as to what is happening uh, on the ground. And particularly we've asked people about uh, the working environment. You might recall uh, at the first lockdown last year, there was a significant um, number of complaints made about um, working environments and a feeling that many were not allowing safe distancing or didn't have appropriate hygiene uh, standards in place. So this year we will be uh, surveying our residents regularly on this question to get an accurate picture. And I think in some ways the first thing to say it's encouraging because 
a clear majority, 55 percent, are saying uh, yes, they, they are in a, a, a safe working environment to a great extent, which is a very encouraging uh, finding. 32 percent of people, if, if people can see the, the purple uh, bar on the, on the graph, that relates to yes, to some extent, which is a slightly more uh, grey area, but still people are saying yes, that that is a, uh, a safe working environment. But there is then 8% um, of, of people reporting no, uh, that they do not believe that the working environment they are in is, is safe. And that is, a, that is a number that certainly cannot be ignored and we won't be uh, ignoring it. So if I could just move on and we, we can share this slide with media colleagues if you are interested in some of the breakdown. What we are um, making public today for the first time is a, a single email address for people to complain. Um, about um, potential breaches of, of legislation or to raise concerns about uh, the working environment. So you can see the email uh, address there, workplace covid safety at greatermanchester-ca.gov.uk. What, what we would say is this is obviously a kind of high profile um, single point of contact for people, for residents, but we would then pass the complaint on to the relevant uh, district uh, and uh, and Greater Manchester um, uh, 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 command. So, you know, we, we will uh, look into all complaints, but we just want to make sure uh, that people have a, a simple way of raising concerns about about workplace safety. If I could just say one final thing before we turn to your questions about um, the work we have un underway with regard to getting all of our young people uh, on online. Uh, we launched last year the Great Manchester Tech Fund, which was a, uh, a, a single um, uh, initiative designed to uh, maximise contributions of support to get all young people online. And um, it, it uh, led to us being able to hand out devices and uh, data bundles to, to, to young uh, people via schools and colleges across uh, Greater Manchester and obviously there is a big call to go to go further as you can see on the slide uh, even if all of the central support that's being promised uh, comes to fruition and there is a big if about that because we're already hearing that uh, schools and colleges are not receiving promised deliveries we heard that from head teachers yesterday even if they did finally get those deliveries we still anticipate that up to 20,000 learners uh, will uh, be left in a position where they can't uh, regularly access um, online online teaching. And that is uh, something that is of great concern uh, to us all. We've been really pleased by the initial response um, from, uh, from businesses uh, to the call uh, for help. Uh, and a number have already been uh, in touch with us to offer uh, offer their uh, support um, just to, to, to name uh, a few um, auto trader the princes trust arup business in the community ans group we thank all of them and there are more too that have, have stepped forward you can see on this next slide uh, what we are specifically asking for it is it is about devices and laptops um, chromebooks ipads but it is as if not more about data and connectivity. That is the message that is coming through um, our discussions with head teachers and, and principals. Uh, and therefore, we are asking uh, some of our bigger players, particularly, to see if they can help um, with connectivity uh, solutions for our for our young people that could be made available to schools to then be passed on to the households that um, that need them most. A common scenario that is uh, is is sort of given to us uh, by head teachers is a house with three or four um, uh, young people within it uh, where there's one device and obviously a, a competition for who can have access to that device uh, which obviously is far from far, far from ideal and uh, that's why we are uh, really um, working hard to see if there's more we can do to uh, improve things. People can supply a kit and um, connectivity solutions, but a donation of £300 to the GM Tech Fund would uh, purchase a, a, a complete uh, digital kit, um, including device and, and data for, for one young person in Greater Manchester. So we would be encouraging people to consider uh, financial contributions as well. And the final slide uh, shows uh, how people can find out more. Um, 
the uh, email address uh, given there. Just to, to say finally, um, you might remember that I uh, asked Diane Modal to lead uh, a piece of work last year around um, what young people need coming through this period and start thinking about a young person's guarantee. A very big theme of that was connectivity for all young people or all young people online. So um, to, to follow on from that work, I've asked Diane to lead up this specific piece of work about um, uh, getting young people online. So um, what I would say to the business community is Diane is the single point of contact who will be uh, reaching out uh, to particularly some of our bigger players. Uh, but if, if people want to get in touch uh, with her, they should do. Uh, she's hopefully going to join the dots for us and see if we can um, make this add up to a, a solution that can add value to what might be provided centrally from the government. So we just wanted to update you all on that today. Um, there remains a, a great deal of focus on this issue, a lot of urgency. Um, if, if we allow this academic year to keep progressing without finding a solution uh, for, for young people, the damage uh, uh, that, that, that would be done could could last a, a significant amount of time. So we are calling on all businesses to work with us on this um, and um, let's build out this Great Manchester Tech Fund in a way that we can provide a solution to all of our all of our young people and get them online. So Ross, I'm going to leave it there, hand back to you and we'll go through the questions. Thanks very much. I'm going to take a question from Steph Oliver at Sky News first. Um, so it's a question for you, Andy. Sadiq Khan has implored Boris Johnson to immediately implement tougher COVID measures or risk putting unsustainable strain on the NHS. Do you think that tougher COVID measures should be put in place immediately? Sorry, Andy, you're on mute. Sorry, Steph. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Steph. I think there is a difference between what's happening in London and uh, the position in Greater Manchester. So I fully understand why Sadiq is saying what he is saying, uh, because um, the increase in cases there in the last few weeks is huge and the pressure on hospitals even greater than it is here. Um, we are in a different position. But as Richard was saying before, perhaps we're only a couple of weeks behind uh, London and perhaps we will soon be experiencing something of the something of the same. Um, however, I think because of the timing of national lockdown, um, I think it is possible that we won't see the same uh, the same pressure that we're, we're seeing in London. I certainly wouldn't rule out uh, further measures. I was pleased to see uh, finally the supermarkets responding to the call that, that I've made before at this briefing uh, for um, face masks to be wear at all times within uh, within stores. I, I certainly wouldn't uh, want to discourage the government from going further in that in that direction. Um, but at the same time, I think the, the key for us is adherence to the current uh, the current regulations in Greater Manchester. And as I said earlier, we, we still are seeing too many too many breaches, and we have to ask again for people. Uh, to follow the rules at all times um, and um, they uh, they if they did that that would lead to a, uh, a, a reduction of the pressure on the hospital system so I, I understand absolutely why uh, Sadiq is saying what he's saying I look at the situation in Liverpool and that is different uh, to us as as well here I wouldn't rule it out at Steph but at this moment in time I think the uh, the current regulations are sufficient for Greater Manchester if people, of course, follow them. Thanks, Andy. Richard, did you want to come in on that one? Yeah, I, well, I think uh, the general point is one that uh, Andy's made is that uh, uh, we need to be wary that the majority of people are complying, that we need to concentrate on uh, uh, those that aren't without alienating those that who, who are. So I think some things they've been talking about, like, for example, further restrictions of outdoor exercise, I think will be very counter. On the other hand, things like supermarkets, whilst I'm delighted that they're with government, is that those, those should be regulation rather than guidance. They should always have been. Uh, enforceable. I think uh, there will be an argument for some things that are currently only guidance, so the things we will be to do, uh, particularly for businesses like supermarkets, that there is a case, I think, for those being made regulation rather than nothing, nothing new, but just more enforceable. Yeah. 
Thanks, Richard. Thank um, Richard, a question for you uh, from Adam Clark at Roch Valley Radio. Um, do you have a borough by borough breakdown of how many people have been vaccinated across Greater Manchester? Uh, well, uh, no, but I also have to say, Adam, that it's not really a very useful piece of information uh, anyway. I did talk last week quite a lot about uh, data and the absence of personalised data. Uh, that What you're talking about, we probably will have uh, relatively quickly, but it's not something we can do anything uh, with. It is knowing who has and who hasn't been vaccinated uh, is a key piece of uh, data. Uh, I'm now going to be uh, say something reasonably positive about something that government has uh, uh, done. Uh, I and a number of other uh, leaders around the country were contacted by Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government over the weekend, uh, asked how the uh, vaccinate, vaccination programme was going. I think he must have had an awful lot of responses from people about the data problem. Came back within 24 hours, having talked to Simon Stevens, Chief Executive, then basically to say that it, 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 they were going to resolve the issue of data, that we expected to get it, it within a, a week or a week or two, and that was confirmed at a meeting that uh, uh, LGA leaders had with Secretary of State uh, yesterday. So the data that we really need, which is that personalised data, uh, we are being promised it by NHS uh, England within the next couple of weeks, and if we get that, then yes, we will be able to give you a borough by borough breakdown, but that's really, uh, it might be of interest, but it doesn't actually help us address the problem. Thanks, Richard. There's one other request uh, laid down from James Much at the Bolton News asking if we had figures um, for patients in the Royal Bolton Hospital with COVID-19 and how this has changed. Is that something we have? Uh, we have and before the, uh, uh, yeah, we, we've got those and I'll probably get them before the end of the call. I've not got them in front of me, but yes, we get that data on a regular uh, on a regular basis. But can I re remind uh, uh, everybody and said this over and over again that looking at individual hospitals uh, is uh, really again uh, not particularly uh, uh, the the way the system operates at the moment. We have our hospitals working together as part of a, uh, of a network, and uh, pressures are moved around the system to try and make sure that we can maximise uh, our capacity. Thanks, Richard. A question for Andy from Alan Brown about Manchester. Uh, at about Manchester, um, they've had many comments that the message from government about rising infection rates is unfairly blaming the public uh, for the lack of compliance. Given that the Home Secretary yesterday evening said that the majority were compliant, can we really blame the old rave and house party for spreading this infection to such an extent that the figures are rocketing? Or are there more underlying reasons such as the continued opening workplaces and education uh, and are they the real drivers of COVID? Thank, thanks, uh, Alan. I think you're certainly right to um, uh, be wary of what appears to be a growing narrative um, to say that it's 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 all the public's fault. I think that's, you know, the wrong, in my view, the wrong way uh, to go. We've got to work hard to keep people with us through uh, this really t tough time. And as Richard was saying, you know, going straight to depriving people of more liberties, particularly around outdoor exercise, I think would um, uh, would, would be counter uh, counterproductive uh, in my in my view. Uh, clearly, the, the, the gatherings I mentioned before, the reports that GMP are, are dealing with do have an impact. There's no it's wrong to say that they they don't. Clearly, they clearly they do. And um, uh, it's important to, um, uh, to to point that out and to to you know ask people uh, again uh, to to comply with the rules. I think um, 623 house parties or gatherings last week is is way too high. And um, you know I think we need to to to, to see people um, sh showing that uh, responsibility, uh, particularly towards the NHS uh, through this through this period. It, you raised the question about continued opening of workplaces, and it's why I've laid some emphasis on that issue uh, today. I think it was an issue that um, wasn't properly addressed during the first national uh, lockdown. I think probably there has been a raising of standards, and the, the figures I presented would appear to show that, but 8% of workplaces that are open, um, or 8% you know, of people saying 
when questioned that they have a concern about their workplace suggests that that is a, a significant issue that requires uh, both the folks at the greater manager level, but also um, from the health and safety executive and, and others uh, as well. So I think those are those there are more underlying reasons that need to be looked at and given significant focus rather than all of the emphasis being on individual members of the public who may not be following uh, the rules. I think where we have workplaces that are not uh, COVID um, uh, compliant, that I would say is a much bigger issue that requires uh, a bigger focus also in the media. And I'd you know, be grateful if uh, it's why we've raised that issue today and um, we'll be grateful for your support in asking businesses to redouble their efforts to um, in improve the safety of their workplaces. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Richard, did you want to come in on that one? <laughs> All right, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm on. It, I think it's, it is really about under, understanding transmissions uh, important and ultimately a lot of this goes back into people's homes, but it's where it comes from in the first first place and uh, relatively COVID secure workplaces are not particularly the place it comes from. Education is not particularly the place it comes from. Indeed, going back to an earlier discussion, uh, it's probably the, the biggest single source of uh, transmission does appear to be actual supermarkets uh, when you look at the uh, uh, look at the stats. Uh, but it is that uh, chain that goes. It starts with younger people, younger people socialising, and ultimately goes back into households that have got older people within it, and they're the people who end up being in in hospitals. So. Uh, is the odd Raven House party? Well, as Andy said, it, if it was the odd one, pro probably not. But uh, uh, it's uh, it's very large, very large number. But it is very much young people socialising and then taking it back and basically transmitting into all older uh, older relatives and friends. That is uh, is is the chain that we need to try and cut it, cut it off. Clearly, when those older people are vaccinated, that's why they've got to be the priority. Then that starts to reduce. The hospitalisation risk that comes from that. Thanks, Richard. I'm going to go on to a question uh, from Alex King at the BTR uh, for Andy. Uh, it's quite a detailed question. Uh, last week, Greater Manchester campaigners wrote to the mayor calling on him to intervene in the UK government's proposed overhaul of the English planning system. The campaigners argue that councils will lose all meaningful control over placemaking under the new planning regime. They also express concern about the process being followed to evaluate the proposed changes the government is currently consulting on the planning for the future white paper. However, there is no guarantee that feedback from the public will affect its plans and it will pass the um, changes using statutory instruments, i.e. without the need for primary legislation. Has Mayor Burnham had sight of the letter and will the combined authority be taking any action? Thank you, thank you, Alex. I'm certainly aware of the letter, and I've had a had a briefing uh, on it. And what we're in the process of doing is preparing a very detailed uh, response to all of the important issues that have been raised. We we have concerns about the uh, the planning white paper, uh, which have been fed in at a at a great Manchester level already. Um, uh, but uh, certainly, we will be able to um, to give a very a detailed response. In return, I think to pick up the general theme, uh, there is a worry about the centralisation of some of these these issues and generally a, a, cent a centralising um, approach to things being taken by by the current government. Um, the proposals, um, you could say, did risk uh, bypassing local authorities, could have uh, could create a situation where we see um, uh, poor standard uh, accommodation being able to, to uh, achieve planning uh, permission. So we, we do share um, uh, some of these uh, concerns uh, and just to um, to assure you that um, a full response will be being sent to, uh, to, to campaigners in the next couple of days. Thanks, Andy. A uh, question from Emma Gill uh, from the MEN. Uh, Andy, you'll have no doubt seen the, the photos of free school meal parcels being shared by families yesterday. Are you shocked by the content of these and who do you feel is to blame? Are you pleased that the national voucher scheme is being reintroduced, reintroduced uh, next week? Uh, also in relation to schools, there have been a number of further concerns over the large number of children attending and the key worker scheme being abused by parents when they are not critical workers. One school has already had to close in full um, to all children because of positive cases amongst teachers and staff. Do you fear this will happen at other schools if attendance remains so high? 
Th th thank you. Uh, thanks, Emma. Um, so on the first question, yes, um, appalled, shocked, um, sickened in many ways, you know, it, it just disgraceful really that um, that kind of offering could be uh, could, could be uh, could be sent out uh, to, to families and you know just to kind of think about what this says about um, the, the way we do things in this country we're outsourcing um, uh, these issues um, to organizations which clearly don't um, don't care enough about um, uh, the people that they're trying to support and you know for those organizations that are counting their millions in terms of what they've made this year uh, and they've done it by obviously uh, taking stuff out of hampers that are just destined for, for for children who are struggling to um to, to find enough to eat well i just find that quite a sad indictment on the the, the times that we're the times that we're in uh, i'm glad that marcus rashford has again played a role in uh, bringing uh, this to national attention alongside some of the campaigners who put these images uh, out there it's um it, it, it's an issue that needs a, a fundamental solution it seems to me um no child should go hungry in this country uh we should have uh schemes in place through the pandemic and beyond uh that, that ensure that all of the money goes to the front line and let's put more i am pleased that the voucher scheme is being uh, reintroduced but i i certainly would why not also extend the cash payments to, to families and let them uh, have the opportunity to get the most that they possibly can for 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 the money that's given to them, rather than creating a systems that allow uh, organisations to to take out a big chunk of the of the um, of the funding through their own their own costs and their own overheads and the the postage and package. I think there's a much much better way of doing this, uh, and I, I I would like to see. Well, I, I think Marcus Rashford and others are beginning to create a. Um, a, a very significant change, I think, to the way these issues are are handled. Uh, I, I know there's a move in Parliament uh, to put the right to food in, in legislation and uh, create a, a, a proper safety net. And um, I think this debate is is, is far from over. I think um, the, the call for substantial change is is getting louder and louder and and not before time. And on the second question. We did meet head teachers. Uh, we have uh, um, met them yesterday, and also MPs last week who raised concerns about the number of uh, of children in uh, in school. Some struggling to accommodate the number of of children in school. However, it is also worth just pointing out that um, the need to have um, uh, two parents as as, as uh, key workers last time perhaps isn't isn't right this time given that um there's, there's so much extra pressure on our public services due to sickness uh and people isolating so i understand why there are more children in in school because of the need to support the front line of our public services at this particular time but we do need to support uh schools to manage that the um the, the pressure that they're um, the pressure that they're they're under and as, as Richard was, was was indicating before, once the priority groups um, have been been done to, to see whether or not there is the opportunity to to make vaccination available to to teachers and school staff as an early as an early priority. Thanks, Andy. Richard, did you want to come in on this one? Uh, and we'll move on to a um, question from uh, Michael Gaffney. I think we'll put this to you first, uh, Richard. Uh, today in Oldham, the local authority are starting to vaccinate homeless people against COVID. This is even though rough sleepers are six on the JCVI priority list, and we are still yet uh, we are yet to vaccinate all the extremely vulnerable people in the five priority groups above them. Do you think Oldham's local officials should be overruling the JCVI priority list unilaterally? What would you say to people higher up the priority list who are still waiting for their jabs while the people in tier six are getting theirs already and if local officials are going to mix and match who they prioritize are they really in any position to criticize the national system for how they're allocating vaccine supplies geographically so richard would you like to speak to that one in the first instance uh, well, uh, first of all, I'm going to be very careful. Uh, I, th I think the question says it's uh, Oldham Council, and certainly it's been suggested that it's not Oldham Council, that it might be one or uh, two GPs in Oldham. So I think we need to be careful about uh, who it is that might be uh, doing this. Uh, having said that, it is something that I addressed in the uh, 
introduction ar around the slides that uh, no uh, local officials wherever they are gps should not be overruling the uh, joint committee's priority at least unilaterally and i think as i said then that at list is who is most likely to be hospitalized who is most likely to end up in critical care who is most likely to uh, die and that priority list is really about uh, trying to prevent uh, deaths trying to prevent the pressure we've got in ICU at, at the moment. Uh, what I also said is that the margins of that so that we don't waste vaccinator uh, time, we don't waste vaccines, that there should be some ability to to infill from standby lists, but that's not changing the priority uh, list. That's just making sure we maximise what resource we've got, uh, we've got available. Um, now, that if somebody comes up with a very convincing case that there is uh, other evidence, then uh, clearly you you look at that. But that's not uh, that's not what we seem to be ha have here. There is a, a very strong evidence case saying that the, the top four categories, that's where we will save most lives quickest. That's what we ought to be following. Thanks. I you want to keep it on that one. It's okay. It's okay. Okay, we'll move on. Um, I just say, uh, given, given we started a little bit late, so I think we're going to run on um, just slightly later as well and take these questions, if that's okay with everyone. Um, question from uh, Mairead at uh, BBC Northwest tonight. Uh, we are hearing of vaccine delays in Salford, Trafford and Rochdale. Are you able to confirm this or comment on it? Richard, would you like to take that one in the first instance? Well, I, I, I don't know uh, about the detail, but again, I said that uh, uh, this week is the first week that we will have all of our uh, vaccination centres up and running. Uh, Simon Stevens, I think uh, the chief executive of NHS England, clearly that uh, uh, there might be constraint on uh, vaccine supplies for a number of uh, a number of weeks. Uh, clearly, it is very worrying if we we're getting delays. But again, I I think it's almost impossible to set up. Uh, uh, an operation on this sort of scale at this sort of speed and not come in with some teething problems as well. So I, I think if they are teething problems, unfortunate, yes. Uh, hopefully things that can be got, got over as quickly as possible. But again, you know, trying to move from zero to vaccinating 90,000 people a week in Greater Manchester alone, uh, clearly uh, it's not going to be perfect immediately. Um, Andy, unless you want to come in on that one, I'll move on to the next question. Uh, uh, just briefly, if I may, uh, yes. Ross, because um, you know this is obviously a, an issue that's um, commanding a lot of our, our time and focus at, at the moment. Um, I had a meeting with the vaccination minister alongside uh, other, other mayors uh, yesterday and um, uh, supply of vaccine was the, the concern that was coming out from the different um, uh, city regions across uh, the country and I did raise um, a concern as, as you've picked up um, that there were some of our districts who'd received less than they they wanted and were geared up to deliver and the point that I made to the minister was that um, you know in, unless these issues were fixed quite quickly we may struggle to hit the um, the mid-February uh, target that the government has set. Now we all want to hit that target. We're, we're, we're doing this positively with the government. We're trying to feed back from the front line so that we, um, um, you know, we, we get ahead of problems before they become bigger, uh, bigger issues. Um, but that there, there would appear to be um, the, the supply isn't yet. Uh, the supply line isn't clear. Um, districts are being given figures. I think about a week in advance that are only confirmed 24 hours before. I think what would help everybody would be if there could be a longer kind of um, line of sight with regard to a delivery schedule uh, for for vaccine. There's also a um, concern about the uh, equitable access policy. We can understand why the government wants to ensure that all areas of the country are getting some vaccine, but of course the need is greater within uh, some of the urban centres and they, they have an infrastructure ready to deliver it. And the concern would be that uh, we're holding back in some places to allow other areas to catch up and I think the government needs to have an eye to equity, uh, geographical equity, but also to health inequalities and um, you know we need to see um, the areas where the risks are highest also being prioritised for vaccines. So we're trying to work these issues through with the government. Um, there is 
I think, a, a concern about the, um, the strength of the supply line at the moment. Um, government are saying that they, they, they hope, they, they believe that these issues are being addressed and the, the volumes will, will start to flow more in, in, in the coming weeks. Uh, but, but certainly um, we will publish these figures every week now to show progress against the February target because it's really important that we all, we all remain very focused on this and come up with practical solutions um, to, to any difficulties that we may have. And I think vaccine also needs to be linked to available capacity so that we, um, we, we make full use of the system in place. Thanks, Andy. A uh, question uh, for Sir Richard from uh, Jen Williams at the MEN. Um, it's about the hospital system. Uh, where pressures are concern, concerned, are we at in terms of your worst case projections or at least those of the system's moves? Uh, and what are your thoughts on the strategy reportedly being drawn up by the NHS in London to discharge COVID positive people into hospitals partly under family care? Uh, I think for the uh, first part, part of the, uh, that question, uh, clearly the modelling, the projections are from the systems modellers, but the systems modellers have been uh, pretty accurate so far in, in terms of uh, what's happened fitting into the range of scenarios that they've produced. I, I think everything I've said this week and last week uh, clearly says we are uh, closer to the worst case projections than we are to the uh, uh, the, the best case scenario and that, and that is the case. We're probably not quite at worst case, but we're not far away from uh, worst case at, at the moment. And that's why we are, at, but certainly why I'm talking about the pressures we've got on our hospital system and the real risk to our hospital system unless we are able to reduce those pressures. The biggest pressure from that point of view is in uh, intensive care because that is the, the thing that has a knock on impact uh, in, in terms of other people who require urgent care within the hospital system. Uh, although again reported that we do have uh, an issue with large numbers of uh, people in general in acute wards as well. We've already uh, had a system for some time of effectively remote care. Uh, people who are COVID positive with, uh, with symptoms getting uh, treatment, staying at home to get get treatment and not being taken into hospital unless the, uh, the, the, the uh, symptoms intensify. So we're already able to do that. Uh, we do at the moment have capacity to be able to discharge people into, uh, uh, into care that will accept COVID, uh, COVID positive. So um, at the moment, it is not a capacity issue in terms of being able to discharge people. It is actually the, the practice of getting them uh, uh, discharge and I don't think we're likely to get into a position where uh, that sort of London solution is is something that we will need to look at. Thanks Richard, Thanks, Richard. Apologies. I think I said uh, discharging people into hospitals where I should have said discharging people into hotels um, so apologies <laughs> on that. Um, uh, Andy did you want to come in on that one at all? So, okay, well. Um, final question uh, for you, Andy, from Dean Kirby at the I. Uh, in December, you said you felt there was a clear case for Greater Manchester to go into tier two. We should have seen uh, some hospitality businesses re reopen over Christmas. Was this the right call, given that Liverpool, which stayed in tier two until the 30th of December, now has one of the highest case rates in the country? Thanks, Dean. Um, just to clarify, I think what I did say was a clear case for parts of Greater Manchester because at that time, at that review point, there were a number of our boroughs that were significantly below the England average and below um, other areas that were kept in tier two, Liverpool being a, being a case in point, but, but other areas uh, as well. And that was uh, before we had uh, any um, strong evidence about the new strain. I mean, those calls were made in, uh, in without the knowledge of, of how the, um, the, the new strain uh, was, uh, was, taking, was taking hold. So you can only act on in this situation on the evidence that you have at the time. And just to make an argument, again, I, I made the argument through December that I didn't think either tier two or tier three were right, because obviously the retail permission given in both um, uh, tiers was, in my view, excessive. It was too permissive 
with regard to non-essential retail, but also with hospitality, you always have the effect of if you close all hospitality, you risk more gatherings uh, in the home. And I personally remain of the view that the difference between tiers two and tier three is uh, not that uh, massive. And just to touch on the second part of your question, which was the Liverpool case rates. And I think this is a learning point for everybody, but particularly the government. If you leave wide swathes of a region in tougher restrictions, but leave one smaller area in looser restrictions, as we had with the case of Liverpool in that period, you obviously create an incentive for people to travel from those other areas into that place with the lower uh, restrictions. And I and I just I don't I don't have the convincing evidence to say that this is absolutely what happened. But I, I do understand that there are concerns within the Liverpool region that that is that might be what has uh, contributed to the rise that, that people have seen uh, in, in Liverpool. And it's why I've always had doubts about the tier system. I think wherever we um, impose restrictions, they should be, in my view, as much as possible done nationally or certainly regionally. Uh, to, to, to prevent against some of the, 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 um, the, the issues that are, that are being raised here. You know, all, all I can say is you know, we make the calls as best we can based on the evidence at the time. And at, at that review point, Greater Manchester um, was, as I say, lower than other areas that went into, into Tier 2, and hence we, we, we pointed, uh, pointed that out. Obviously, that call would have absolutely been changed by the evidence that the government was beginning to see around the new strain, which wasn't available to us at that particular particular time. So I think we've all got to carry on learning all the way uh, through this and we've got to uh, bear those lessons in mind when it comes to the exit from uh, from national lockdown, whenever that comes in February uh, or, or March. Uh, I, again, I, I would want to, um, to, to, to warn the government about just going back to the old tier system because I, I still have concerns about, about the way it's working, uh, working in practice. So, um, uh, you know, uh, all I can say to you is, from a Greater Manchester point of view, we, we have tried to call this on the evidence at every single point, and, um, and that is what we did, uh, did then, and it's what we'll continue to do. That's us um, out of questions uh, for today. Um, so unless you get any final thoughts, we can finish. Can I just say, I, I ought to come back on the Bolton question, uh, that uh, I've been reminded that that data belongs to uh, uh, Bolton, and so they'll have to, the, the journalists will have to contact the hospital, the trust to get that data. I think, to just to add to, to, add to that, uh, I think generally, I think there is an ongoing issue, isn't there, about uh, the issuing of data. Uh, particularly from the NHS, and um, uh, while Richard is absolutely right, it, it, it is it is uh, not our decision. Uh, you know, I think um, you know we, we sometimes have found it difficult uh, with regard to some of the uh, uh, with regard to, to NHS uh, uh, data. Um, just to finish, Ross, I mean, uh, you know, this, as, as Richard said, is a is a a, a, a very uh, uh, kind of challenging moment in this in this whole journey, but as we've kind of put forward today, people can see that the solution taking shape with regard to a vaccination program that is really rolling out in Greater Manchester. I would want to thank um, everybody involved in the um, the standing up of the mass vaccination centre at the Etihad this week. It had a um, a really a good start. It has had a really good start, and I think the the feedback is positive from the people uh, using it. So I just want to. Um, uh, send my um, uh, thanks to the team from the Northern Care Alliance, particularly who've been very much involved in, in standing up that uh, service. There is a massive amount of work going on across Greater Manchester. I just want to assure everybody of, of that across all of our uh, districts. People are very, very focused on this uh, task. We've also seen the military um, uh, on the ground uh, here this week, helping stand up uh, more targeted mass uh, testing. So. Greater Manchester is actually in a really, a really uh, strong position in terms of the um, uh, the infrastructure that's now in place, both in terms of testing and vaccination. And just to finish on a more positive note, of course, we don't know where we will end up with the cases, but national lockdown has given us an opportunity, perhaps, not to see the same sort of peak that we have seen in other parts uh, of the country. Um, and what we need now to do is 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 obviously follow the rules. But if we do, 
um, I think we might be uh, in a better position uh, coming out of, of all of this. And the final point I will make today, Ross, is, um, and I do very much want colleagues in the media to, to, to work with us on this, at some point we have to move the debate back onto test and trace because you know that issue can't just be look like it's gone and everyone's given up on it test and trace will be critical in the rest of this year as we get the case as the vaccination program takes effect as we see the case numbers starting to fall test and trace becomes more and more important when it comes to managing the end game and once the numbers are falling their job becomes more manageable because they, they, they then can deal with that lower number of cases. But test and trace has to be, uh, has to be uh, fixed so that it works at a local level. Concerns raised by leaders of our councils yesterday that the self-isolation payment scheme is not working. And in a majority of cases, people are being turned down for that uh, payment. Uh, we believe that the isolation part of test and trace is also a critical link in the chain. And all of these issues need to be fixed and they need to be fixed uh, alongside the rollout of the vaccination programme because test and trace is another important uh, element of managing this this um, this crisis uh, away. So we do need to see focus return to test and trace uh, and uh, you know the the fixing of the problems that, that have been pointed out by uh, people here in Greater Manchester over recent times. Uh, that that is a, a critical part of the um, the, the solution uh, as we go into the rest of 2021 and more more focus I think needs to return to that issue. But uh, Ross, with that, um, I think we we will leave it there. Thank you, Richard, for joining us. Thank you, everybody uh, in the media for your questions, and we will see everyone next week.